because it was a cruising boat and it was a fellow I'd met. Actually, I met him in the boat yard in, in Durban and I ended up working for him and uh, in the boat yard and we became friends and when he left um, Durban to go to Cape Town and across to Brazil, he asked if I wanted to come along and um, at that point I'd spent a couple of years in the Indian Ocean and I was ready to go somewhere else so I said yeah I'd tag along and I was just going to get off in the Caribbean somewhere. Hey, welcome back. I'm Chris Chase with the Western Flyer Foundation. And in this episode, it is all about corking. I had the great opportunity to sit down with Greg Friedrichs and Brad Siemens, two of the guys that have been corking on the Western Flyer for a few weeks and two of the finest corkers I've ever met. We get to hear their story. They both have really unique journeys to getting to the Pacific Northwest. Brad moved here in uh, 2005 to go to the Northwest School of Wooden Boat Building. And Greg actually grew up in South Africa and migrated to the Pacific Northwest via Maine, where he attended the Bath Maritime Museum's apprenticeship program in 1994. So both really unique journeys to get to the Northwest, but we are super lucky to have them on the Western Flyer. And before the comment box blows up anymore, in the Pacific Northwest, regionally, we refer to it as corking, not caulking. Everybody I know refers to it as corking. You do hear caulking once in a while, but in the Pacific Northwest, the way we've learned it, the way it's always been taught is you cork up an old wood boat, you don't caulk up an old wood boat. So just to clarify that. And the other thing I wanna do, before I get any further in the video is I want to give a big thank you to one of the viewers. About 14 months ago, a viewer reached out. They wanted to share their family story. It was actually the wife's family story. Her great-grandfather started the Rang Shipyard in Bellingham, Washington in 1917. They ran that yard all the way up until the mid to late 1960s. They built trollers and saners like the Western Flyer. They got involved in military contracts during the war. But somewhere along the way, her father got involved in the shipyard and he became a shipyard corker. And she wanted to come up and donate his corking bag. She brought this beautiful old leather bag. This was his daily bag. He carried this to work every day for decades as a shipyard corker. Open it up and inside and there was this beautiful black mesquite Drew mallet. There was a nice quiver of Drew irons. You're gonna hear the word Drew in this video a few times. But it was just an unbelievable gift, totally unexpected. But I'm just constantly amazed at how the restoration of the flyer has touched a lot of lives in a lot of different ways. And this is just one of those examples. So thank you very much from myself and the, the Western Flyer Foundation. But let's get on with the video about corking. Six, eight months later, when I got off the boat in Maine, uh, we decided to come out to the West Coast because Amy had been living out here for a couple of years. She'd actually spent a summer in Alaska um, working on a packer. And um, so we drove cross country. I ended up working on Bainbridge at, at, in the boat yard there, just all pickup work, really. And uh, I think I came up here the first time to work on the Westwood. And uh, you were working at Ernie's. I actually lived on your sailboat. Like we all did, either at boat school or at the apprentice shop, we learned the basics, right? The, the Maritime Museum education was, I, if I compared it to the school here, it was a lot, it was a lot more casual, I would say. It, uh, and I, I, because of the labor for learning situation that um, the school took on paying work. So you might, depending on where you were in the program, you might get to work on a small boat or you might get to learn how to plank on a 40-foot lobster boat. So, um, so it just, uh, there wasn't a, I guess, as structured curriculum as there, there is at the school here. But, um, but I still got to learn planking, and framing, and some small boat construction, and um, some lofting, and, um, but 
there was a lot of hands-on work, actually. I did, I, I was kind of intrigued with it in the beginning, and maybe it's because of it's the old-timey part, you know, it's just, it's, well, it's a little bit, and it's also, it's no just way. unchanged, as it's, there's nothing about it that has really evolved, and part of that was fascinating, just because I like all this old, old boats and how they're put together, and, um, and so I did make an effort to learn more about it, and then I, Put myself, you know, out there to be in a position to work with other people who are really good at it. And also, I guess I got lucky too. I got to go on some work with some with people who've done it a long time on some bigger jobs. I get, the thing about caulking is that you have to do a lot of it to get good at it, right? And you can't, you can't, and you can't draw someone a picture of how to do it. Like you could you can draw a picture of cut a corking barrel on a plank and you can all, you could probably fudge it a little bit when the time comes but you you can't really it's hard to do that with corking. You really just got to do the time, you know, put the time in to do it. And my first when I graduated from my undergraduate program um, one of the students went on to design boats at the landing school in Kenny Bunkport um, immediately after college. And so that was kind of always in the back of my mind. I thought, man, that would be a really incredible skill to learn um, design wise, because it kind of went hand in hand with architecture. Um, but I think when I, I, I grew up working with my hands, and so a lot of what I thought about when I thought, what do I want to do for the rest of my life, I felt like it had to be hands-on. Uh, I ended up finding the Wooden Boat School online and decided, why not? So I moved to Port Townsend and uh, went to the Wooden Boat School in 2004 and 2005. I was really fortunate. Um, immediately after graduating school, uh, actually a couple months prior to, um, my previous captain, uh, Wayne Cimenti from Adventurous, said, hey, uh, we're going to be doing a, a haul out and a bunch of planking and framing on Adventurous. Um, yeah, would you like to be, we need a shipwright's apprentice. And so I immediately jumped on that and I said, absolutely. Uh, and I started working for the boat. I was paid by the boat, $10 an hour. But what that really did was it showed the company that was working on the boat, uh, my skills. Um, so once that project was done, three months later, I was hired on and I was at that, uh, my previous employer for 10 years. I joined the Shipwrights Co-op about five years ago now um, as an employee, and I knew the Western Flyer was coming into that shop, and um, I walked by one day, and um, Chris actually said, oh, you know, I said, what are you guys doing in here? He said, oh, I'm moving Western Flyer into the shop, and I thought, I said, wow, that'll be an amazing project, and, and um he said, yeah, if you ever are interested, you know. So I came over and talked for a little bit and um, decided that that was the place I'd like to be, especially if I had an opportunity to work on the Western Flyer. I realized pretty quickly that um, a lot of what I was doing in the boatyard was planking and framing. And to make a plank and not be able to cork it seemed like, something I didn't really want. I didn't want to hand that off to somebody else. It comes out of the barrel kind of lumpy and uh, different thicknesses and and if you, if you it's just harder to get it in the seam and the whole idea is to be able to cover some distance so um, if you take a lumpy lumpy open and and spin it and spread it out a little bit into a uniform diameter, 
it's a lot easier to get in the boat. Really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating a lot of really tiny wedges in that seam. The seam itself is a wedge. And then I'm taking that cotton and I'm making these little cotton wedges. Um, and if you, I think if you'll look at the footage and you'll see some, some seams will have, when I'm threading cotton, some of the seams will have a, a, a larger amount of cotton in there and another seam will have a little less. Or I might be threading and then I'll change and I'll tuck it less or tuck it more. So it's adjusting to the seam. Um, and really all those little tucks are little wedges being driven into a bigger wedge, which is creating tension. You know, on a boat like the Flyer, it's, there's such consistent seams that it's really easy to thread consistently with a consistent, not only tuck, but also span between tucks. first layer of cotton, you want the cotton to go all the way to the back of the seam, back of that wedge. Um, and on the flyer, actually, I've been putting two, two rows of cotton in and, um, and a la layer of oakum on top. And with all that set back, at the end, it sets everything. The caulking seam is mostly full. There's enough room for putty on top. And that's really, that's kind of the goal. The way you're supposed to use the mallet is to let the impact on the knob, the recoil, that's, you're supposed to use that recoil force to let your mallet come back. And then you start, so you're really only using the forward motion. You should never have to pull the mallet back, even when, especially when you're underhand, because that's something that you let that um, recoil kind of act as your next generation for your forward movement. Right, you're trying to, you're trying to do, have the mallet do most of the work. You can't, it can't always be like that. At a certain point, you've got to have material go back and you've got to, you've got to swing at it and you've got to have your hand at the bottom of the hand and you've got to have that momentum to get it all back there. The biggest mistake I've seen people who will acquire a mallet off of eBay or something or buy from a friend is oftentimes these are made with a handle that's a broomstick. <laughs> and uh, I've learned over the years, the, the bigger the handle you can have, it actually keeps you from wanting to grasp the, the handle really tight. Because when you're holding the mallet really tight, it ends up transferring a lot of that uh, reverb off of the, the irons back to your hand, um, which, you know, just ends up giving you lots of, lots of problems through your, your hand, your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder. Um, so, you know, the bigger the handle, in my opinion, the better. When you end up getting near those final seams in a section of a, of a hull, even yesterday, Greg and I were corking and we got, I got to the last seam that completed the entire section of planks from sheer to garboard. And you could just, you not only hear it, you don't hear it in the, in the, threading where your mallet hits the iron you hear it in the low thud that is the sound of the wood because that low thud turns into this high-pitched hard sounding almost like a rock and yesterday uh, Greg and I both when I when I made that last seam um, we kind of looked at each other and like, Greg do you hear that and he's like oh man she's tight now when you're just corking at a high rate of speed, a lot of those details get lost. Um, so when you see it in slow motion, it definitely, um, it kind of narrows down and it shows the level of finesse required. Um, but at the end, at the end of the day, it is, it is a lot of, 
a lot of hard banging. <laughs> Hey, that's it, the end of another chapter in the rebuilding of the Western Flyer. Before we take off though, I wanna give a big thanks to Greg and Brad. I had a great time interviewing those two guys. I've known Greg for almost 25 years. It was fun to kind of hear some of those old stories, a couple of new stories. I hope everybody enjoyed that part of the video. As for upcoming videos, we got a lot of great stuff happening with the flyer. Plenty of woodwork still to be done. There's a deck to be laid, interior bulkheads, there's a giant house to go back on the deck. But I think it's time to start sprinkling in some mechanical videos. So look for after the first of the year, January, February going forward, a lot more mechanical videos coming in between some of these woodworking videos. Talking about the engine, the electrical, the mechanical, all of the systems that go into an 80 foot fish boat. So a lot of great stuff coming up. And if you want to keep track of the project kind of in between each episode, uh, I do post pretty regularly to Instagram. So that's Chase Boat Builder on Instagram. I'll put a link below in the description box. And we just launched a new website at the Western Flyer Foundation. And I'll definitely put a link to that in the description box. There's some new content there. Uh, it's kind of spotlighting the foundation. But anyway, until the next episode, next video, thanks for watching. We both started, you and I and Tim and E. Ross. You know, we didn't work 12 months a year in the boatyard. No, no. It wasn't 12 months a year of work. It wasn't this magical place where you just got a job like a career. No, well, we didn't, we didn't, for, and we didn't want that at, at that point either. We were, you know, Amy and I were young and we traveled. If we right, had, we'd all come home and you'd, you'd make the money you could and then you'd, you know, we were all younger like everybody. You'd vagabond around a little bit. And,